Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 61 of Interstellar Quest, and we have an asteroid which we have discovered that is going to be paying a visit to Kerbin, a visit which will be altogether too close for us to ignore it. Yes, it's going to crash into the surface, and while it may not do much damage due to the game's limited ability to model such things, we think that it's prudent and worthy for us to perhaps launch a mission to intercept it. Now, you see how the projected orbit is inclined? What I'm going to do is try to put my spacecraft on the same orbit, but in reverse, so that we actually come... Uh, we basically head back down its path and meet up with it before it can ever collide with us. So what I'm doing is time accelerating until the launch site is more or less underneath this orbit. Then I'm going to fly up over the top, swing around the planet, and hopefully head off to an encounter with this rocky body. Okay, that's us got all our stuff set up. The object is targeted, so we see the pink, uh, pink marker on the nav ball showing us where we ultimately have to go. And uh, coming back in, you can see that it is still nighttime. Thankfully, I have this other little uh, mod here. This is the ambient light enhancer, and I can just drag that up a little so that you guys can actually see what is going on despite the fact that it is nighttime. No more will you be left in the dark. But we start to head off into space. The crew for this mission are, of course, Rusty Kerman and Ed Lou Kerman. Experts in killer asteroids, who else would I have? Anyway, from where they are, they can't actually see what's going on because they are, of course, inside the aerodynamic fairing. I'm going to cut through most of this launch sequence because, let's face it, you've seen many, many launch sequences before. It's more or less your standard fare where we uh, cut the engines when we get to uh, an orbit with an apoapse of 100 kilometers and, of course, fire off that rather nice fairing so we can actually get a look at the spacecraft that we've got here. We have that rather nice two-man B9 cockpit, a plasma drive, and of course beamed power receivers. So yeah, we uh, set our orbit up to try and go back the way we came, which means an escape burn, more or less going back along here. Now, you want to kind of get the the departure point at roughly the same place on the edge of the sphere of influence. So I set up my burn and slowly turn the spacecraft because I don't have a huge amount of torque on this thing. 919 meters per second burn, that's what I need. And very quickly that main engine will bring our bring our velocity up. Of course we run out of power and or run out of fuel and have to switch to the next stage, which is another 3.75 meter stage. Both of those engines are, of course, from the the new KSP.235, the NASA pack. Those engines have excellent thrust to weight ratios. In fact, some people think they might be a little overpowered. Anyway, I need to trim this orbit a little more to try and bring myself onto an encounter with it. You can see in the background the number, the, the actual encounter that we're seeing, right? And uh, I'm pretty much going to cut out what I ended up doing, but I managed to bring my, my encounter down to about a hundred and something kilometers. And uh, from there, it's uh, two minutes to uh, wait to get into the actual burn position. We want to be as close as possible, and it's 395 meters per second of delta V dumped into the quest to meet this asteroid as quickly as possible. You see that we're actually burning more or less lateral to our actual velocity here. So this is a straight up course correction that will bring us nice and close towards our target. Now one thing to be wary of with the uh, deep space encounters is that the accuracy of the, the map really isn't that good once you get to large distances. And so even though it says about 117 kilometers, I can't guarantee that I will actually come that close. Uh, it could You could come a lot closer, I guess, than what the map is saying because the map's precision doesn't always seem to reflect the actual encounter. So anyway, yeah, once we get within a certain range, it's all going to be manual encounters anyway. And so yeah, there we are, coming in towards the target at about 1400 meters per second. And uh, you can see the encounter off there in the distance. We're like maybe 
Well, what are we? A thousand? We're we're like less than fifteen minutes out from the target, so I have to start killing my velocity now. Very quickly using this main engine, we slow the thing down, burning off the remains of our chemical fuel. Once that's gone, we will have to switch to the plasma thruster, and the plasma thruster will not get nearly as much thrust, so we have to approach much more carefully. You see, uh, if you had just used a manoeuvre node to arrange that encounter, it might have told you that this would take 30 seconds, but of course that wouldn't take into account the fact that we had to deploy these nice arms and this this cool little plasma engine to actually get ourselves approaching the target at a reasonable rate. We have 470 meters per second of delta V to kill before we encounter this object. And uh, with 1.2 gigawatts of power, it still takes us a reasonable amount of time to do so. This whole uh, encounter and breaking scheme took me the best part of an hour to get in there. Now, obviously, we are going on for a hands-on approach here, partly because it lets us bring along our heroes for the ride, and partly because it uses the technology that we currently have in the Asteroid Redirect mission, the Claw, which in itself isn't that realistic, but it's what the game works within the game. Realistically, if you found an asteroid, well, first of all, you would hope you would have more than 10 days warning. Ideally, uh, if Sentinel works, you will have years of warning to adjust an orbit of an asteroid. And at that level, you only need a few millimetres per second to make sure that it misses the Earth completely. You can do this in a number of ways. You can do this with a simple kinetic impactor. Um, for larger objects, if you really need the force, you could use uh, nuclear devices. They're great because, and for some reasons because they put a lot of energy into a very small package, but actually coupling that energy with an asteroid is a questionable, uh, a questionable event. We're not really sure how well that actually would work in reality. Um, there's another one where you don't actually need to touch the asteroid. It's something called the Gravity Tractor, which is uh, something, again, the real Dr. Ed Liu had a hand in. The idea being that the asteroid has gravity, but so do spacecraft. You know, spacecraft, although they may only weigh a couple of tons, they will have their own gravity. And if you park uh, a spacecraft in orbit around the asteroid and keep occasionally firing your thruster, as you fire the thr thruster, you give yourself some velocity, but then the asteroid's gravity will pull you back. So you can slowly transfer the energy or the acceleration from your thruster onto the asteroid without actually touching it at all. Anyway, with one kilometer to go, I think it's time we return to old me and my attempts to actually rendezvous with this asteroid. Oh yes, we are now inside the one kilometer mark. Moving at 10 meters per second, this is one of the more... Um, careful approaches I think I have made in my in my <laughs> Kerbal Space Program career, but with that plasma engine you cannot you can't risk it suddenly not working as well as you expected otherwise you end up flying by the target as you realize you don't have enough power, but I'm getting pretty close to the magic 1.21 gigawatts of power okay, so I'm just burning off center here or thrusting off center, the idea being to push my uh, retrograde vector or velocity vector right onto the target. We're getting really close. Just make sure we don't crash into it because that would really suck. Uh, we just want to kill off all my velocity. Now we're like 50 meters out. What I want to do is get my relative velocity down to zero. Then we can uh, target the center of mass and more or less come in for the capture. And We can do that in in crew cockpit style. Okay, target center of mass. MMT 681. That's what we've called it so far. I think I shall call my spacecraft the Little Prince. And we all know what the asteroid is going to be called, right? Okay, the claw is deployed, ready for capture, and now we need to line this up. And I'm doing this from the IVA view, the reason being that you can actually zoom in on the nav ball and therefore make your uh, interface with the target as accurate as possible. You can get way better accuracy from the IVA because you can zoom in like that. And 
since we're going to be thrusting against this, we want to be as close to perfectly lined up with the center of mass so that we don't induce a rotation in the object. Now, one of the things that Kerbal Space Program doesn't really do yet is have these asteroids have natural rotation. That is a real problem for real asteroids if you're going to try and land on it and adjust its orbit. The fact that it's spinning is a big problem. And especially when you consider that uh, it actually would take a lot of fuel or whatever to actually slow the thing down. Anyway, I'm just going to be very careful. Look at that. There we go. Coming in towards our target. Lined up almost perfectly. Oh dear, it's just like playing that claw game in the arcade, right? <laughs> Only I don't win crappy prizes here. I get a giant chunk of space rock. I, I don't know, is there a way to figure out how far I am? What we need is a display on the... Oh, I, can, I see shadows, I see shadows. We're picking up some dust. Uh, no, wait. And, and, yes, we have an asteroid. Woohoo! We successfully captured an asteroid, which will, if we don't change its orbit, will drag us down into the atmosphere of Kerbin and kill us. But I intend to make sure that does not happen. Look at that. Look at that, a prime example of this species, a Class C massing maybe, I don't know, 60 tons? I'm not sure. It's heavy enough that we're going to have to make sure that we have enough fuel left over. Okay, Rusty, being the EVA specialist, is going to go out and take a quick look around. We're going to examine this thing from every angle. I mean, really, if you're going to be moving an asteroid, one of the first things you want to do is get photographs and sensor data from every single angle. You want to see whether there's rubble and stuff on the surface. Uh, you know, if you want to push this thing, it might be that it is a rubble pile, and if you try to accelerate it too quickly, it will just break apart. That's one of the things the gravity tractor also deals with nicely, in that since the coupling is by gravity, it does take a long time, but it won't... Uh, it doesn't ensures that the force is equally applied throughout the body, more or less. Yep, looks like we have plenty of space. Let's uh, go in and get a sample here. So, the one real new science biome that was added is... Well, basically the science that was added is you can now get surface samples, even when you're in deep space. That does have the weird problem that the surface sample you get depends upon where you are rather than what type of asteroid that is. Anyway, let's give this thing a name. What name would be more appropriate than B612? There we go, B612, the home of the Little Prince. A well-named chunk of rock with great history. We shall have to bring it home for further study because we will actually get better study if we go into the different biomes. Let's bring that sample back inside the cabin. You see that they actually have plenty of space there. They've got space for six astronauts. But there's only the two of them, so they can uh, have plenty of room to stretch their legs and things like that. Okay, I collect a sample of the asteroid and I send that data home so that it may be studied in even greater detail. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is send this little probe and attach it to the surface using the grappling hook. If you remember, I used the grappling hook previously to capture a spacecraft that was uh, flying past Kerbin at really high speeds. Well, I'm going to use it to attach to this asteroid because... Um, if you want to track an asteroid, you will really want to put a radio transmitter on it so it gives you perfect positioning. The sensitivity of many impact solutions entirely depends upon how accurately you can you know, calculate the position. So if you think you have an object that's going to hit the Earth, the first thing you do is land a satellite on it so that it can actually get perfect telemetry, perfect positional data, so you can figure out whether it really will hit or not. So here goes nothing. And in we come for an impact here, just try to find a nice little place that I can attach this thing. And it's kind of annoying because the controls are ass backwards because the front of the spacecraft is facing towards me. There we go. Clamp. I said clamp. How come that worked so well in the, the other one? Okay, let's try again. Let's pull back a little. At least there's no problem aiming this thing. It's just a question of attaching to that rock. No, no. 
Okay, well, screw that for a lark. Uh, apparently, this grappling hook doesn't want to grapple onto Asteroid. It is... Clearly, the grappling hook is made from astrophobic material. Try once more. Oh, yeah, bounced off. Okay. Well, that's not going to work. <sighs> I'll just park this here first, I guess. Okay, we are ready to move this. We are going to send it onto a new orbit, which will make it fly safely past Kerbin and perhaps provide an opportunity for us to capture it. So let's just adjust our antenna. Uh, unfortunately, we need to rotate the whole asteroid to bring the antenna to maximum power output. I want my 1.21 gigawatts. Okay, very carefully doing this. And then the next thing we need to do is free the pivot so that we can make sure our spacecraft is exactly lined up through the center of mass. And I'm going to do this from the cockpit again because I can zoom right in on this and line up the pink dot with the middle. Okay, so here's the only thing is once I'm lined up, I can't lock it from inside the spacecraft. Um, I, I guess time accelerate will work. <laughs> time and then I can lock this thing again. Oh, apparently it locks when you time accelerate. Well, that's a really convenient trick to know. You heard it here first. Okay, we have 1.2 gigawatts of power. And uh, yeah, let's start moving this spacecraft, this uh, asteroid and everything. There, make sure we are in liquid propulsion mode. We don't want to use our all our RCS. There we go, starting to accelerate that little space probe that couldn't do its job is going to be left on this orbit. You know why? Because this orbit is going to bring it into an encounter with the planet Kerbin. And hey, it'll be like science. We'll know where it would have hit if I hadn't changed its orbit, right? And of course, since changing orbits takes a really long time, old me decided to let new me narrate while the whole thing ran at four times regular speed. So we are firing our engine prograde. And the reason is we want to make sure the asteroid goes into an orbit which is more or less rotating the same way as Kerbin, so that we are not going retrograde when we get to Kerbin. This is going to take more delta V. It means we have to thrust and adjust our trajectory through the planet Kerbin. So we actually made the impact solution more and more likely initially. And then eventually, you can see me switching back and forth as I try to get some good shots of this spacecraft moving the target. Look at that. Isn't that a magnificent spacecraft? Look looking out the windows and reading things and seeing things and looking at this panel and seeing what we have. We have fuel, apparently. Poor Rusty sitting in the back seat doesn't really have any side windows to look out and admire the stars. All he can do is look ahead and see the, the back of Edlu's head and the, the asteroid in front of them. But yet, after about 30 meters per second of Delta V, we are almost ready to switch back to old me. Come on, 1.2 gigawatts of power is... Oh, look, wait, there we got it. We got a periaps with 300... Oh, wow, okay, so we overdid that just a little. Okay, but we're not going to go back on this because missing the planet Kerbin by 300 kilometers is a pretty good margin. That is half a planetary radii. So what we've got now is we're going to set up a set up an alarm so that we can actually... Um, do something in three days' time when we're actually supposed to start dealing with getting this thing into orbit. Looks like we're going to have plenty of fuel. And uh, yeah, for the next three days, we will perhaps make ourselves at home in the asteroid. So since we couldn't actually attach the space probe to the asteroid, I'm going to use some stuff in these toolkits to build a transponder on the surface. So we have some struts that are just attached to the side. I didn't bother to put the put these cubic octagonal struts in the toolkits, I just attach them to the side of the spacecraft and I'll pull them off and use them where necessary. So this will be part of my probe base, which will hopefully attach to the surface. I don't know, Kerbal Attachment System may decide that this doesn't actually work. Let's see, get in close and come on, attach, attach. 
Apparently it attaches using standard electric screwdrivers. The other thing I'm going to need is a little uh, antenna and I also have one of those stuck to the side. Again, for precisely this reason. We have a whole bunch of extra stuff that I can pull off and then there's specialized stuff in those toolkits. Anyway, there's that antenna we're looking for right behind the light. Come to Rusty. Come to Rusty. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. There, yes, excellent. Now let's take that over and attach it to the asteroid, or attach it to the little cubic octagonal base station. And since we've got this asteroid onto a nice, safe, carbon-avoiding orbit, I think this is a good place for us to leave things as Rusty finishes his little uh, base station there. See you in episode 62. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.